and regulation, electricity restructuring and market design, transmission access pricing, and has active research on market integration, transmission planning and finance, climate change policies, and the design of energy policy and energy tax action. Occasional economic advisor to Obgen or Guat and other institutions. Former member of the Competition Commission and chairman of the Dutch Electricity Markets Surveillance Committee. He is currently a member of Obgen, Obgen's Low Carbon Network Fund, a member of the panel of technical experts offering quality assurance to the to DEC on the delivery of the UK's electricity market reform and the deputy independent market of the single electricity market of Ireland. But allow me to devote a few words to his contribution as few academics can be credited with scientific research as solid a professor Negris. It is impossible to refer to all his work, but I would like to highlight some significant papers for me. A theorem on the measurement papers of measurement of inequality, among many other studies in collaboration with Stiglitz, the theory of commodity price stabilization rules, welfare impacts and supply responses, and the theory of commodity price stabilization, a study in the economics of risk. His article with Gilbert, preemptive patenting and the persistence of monopo monopoly, which offers a new line of monopoly analysis. The role that asymmetries in size and cost has in determining prices, allowing for higher profit market margins by large companies, while the smaller are price takers, is crucial. It's crucial in the interpretation of the size of market power. His article. His article, Competition in the British Electricity Spot Market, mark a change in the methodology in the study of monopoly, monopoly markets, especially electricity sector. Determining the pivotal, the pivotal, sorry, the pivotal role of plants is crucial in the electricity sector to establish, to now, their market power. The privatization of the electricity sector required a uniquely designed market, a uniquely designed market model, and a specific tools to analyze the conditions of competitions. Professor Negri resolved this conundrum. Empirical applications and policy implications also occupy a large part of his work. Few scholars have been so influential in both the scientific community and policy. And policy. Professor Neighbury, it is an honor, a pleasure to welcome you as the keynote speaker in this symposium. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Costa. And thank you for those very generous words of introduction. Um, and it's a delight to be invited back again to Barcelona. Uh, last time I was here at a different university, we were discussing electric vehicles as a way of decarbonizing transport. But today, uh, we're going to talk about capacity auctions specifically, and I should immediately say that although, as Professor Costa said, I advise the government on its delivery and this, um, in particular of the capacity auctions, 
I'm speaking here as an academic, and I'm not going to use any information that is not already published. Uh, and indeed, our panel of technical experts has, uh, pub does publish independent reports on the progress <coughs> of market reform. Uh, so, uh, let me say what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to start with the problem of how you define security of supply, and this is really critical to deciding what you need to do. Um, I'm then going to talk about energy-only markets because that is the model of the target electricity model, the third package. Uh, and so the obvious question is, well, is that sufficient to deliver security of supply? Uh, and then I want to talk about some of the misperceptions that certainly affected our Secretary of State when he decided how much capacity needed to be procured, uh, what the problem was that the capacity auction was designed to address, um, and what uh, the remedies that were proposed, uh, how they work. Uh, so I'll talk about the capacity mechanism um, and what initially was thought to be the impact whenever British policy uh, is proposed, it has to be accompanied by an impact assessment so that one can assess whether it's sensible policy. Uh, we'll look at that. <clears throat> and then um, some of the criticisms that our panel made, and which I have uh, subsequently uh, <coughs> published in a working paper. <clears throat> um, and one of the main criticisms we made is that the analysis completely ignored interconnectors. Um, and since interconnectors were also argued to be improving security of supply, this seemed to be contradictory. Uh, so then we look at what happened in the auction in December and what lessons we can draw. Uh, so first of all, uh, let's look at security of supply as the Europeans look at it. Um, and you can see the orange bits means that there's less than 0% of so-called reliability margin above adequacy. Um, but notice that the country that is signaled out there, Germany, is surrounded by other countries, some of which have spare capacity. So the idea that you can treat each country separately is itself somewhat mistaken, and um, that is a theme I'll come back to. So uh, let's look at how uh, it's conventionally defined, the security of supply. Uh, and we start with the fundamental proposition of measuring the loss of load probability, which is the probability in any time period, in Britain it's every half hour, <clears throat> that the demand will be greater than supply. Um, and I'll come back to exactly what that means in a minute. Um, and then if you add up all those probabilities over the course of the year, you would find the loss of load expectation, the number of hours a year in which you would expect demand to be greater than supply. And then you decide what is an acceptable level, and in many countries it's three hours. I think in Belgium it's eight hours, uh, but uh, in Britain it's certainly chosen as three hours a year. And you can work backwards from that and say, well, what does that imply the value of lost load is? How much would it cost you to deliver that security standard? Uh, and in Britain, it's 17 pounds, which I guess is about 22 euros a kilowatt hour. Uh, that is about 150 times the average price of electricity. Uh, so this is a significantly high price implied as the value of lost load. Now, if you ask what the theory tells us, the efficient price in a market, uh, in an electricity market, should be not just the short-run marginal cost, but also a capacity payment, a scarcity value when the capacity is not sufficient to meet demand, uh, and that is the loss of load probability times the value of lost load. And indeed, <coughs> when we ran the electricity pool after privatization, uh, that calculation was made explicitly by the system operator and added on to the system marginal cost. Um, so you can either require or hope that the generators will just bid their marginal cost. In Ireland, they are legally required to do that. And then the system operator adds on this capacity payment element. Or <coughs> uh, you can expect that generators themselves will recognize scarcity and price appropriately. Uh, so this model certainly has been applied 
um, and continues to be applied in Ireland. Um, now, uh, the reason why um, the government became rather nervous about security of supply can be illustrated by this um, diagram from Ofgem, the regulator in Britain, and it gives uh, under different scenarios, uh, depending on uh, what you think the future will be, there's a gone green scenario and then there's a no progression scenario depending on the enthusiasm with which governments pursue renewables targets and the uh, unenthusiasm or otherwise of the generators investing. Uh, so you can see that in 2015-16, uh, in other words, next winter, uh, it looks as though the situation is going to be tight in the sense that there is a significant chance that we exceed this standard of loss of load expectation of three hours. Uh, notice that by 2018, um, things look fine. Uh, 2018 is the first year in which our capacity auction is to deliver extra capacity. So we have a short run problem which is not going to be addressed by a capacity market. Uh, we will just rely on the energy market and one or two other things, uh, but in four years' time, we expect a problem to arise, and I'll explain why. So, um, we ask the obvious question, can the energy-only market that the European model requires or implies that we should adopt, will that deliver security? Um, and we have, in Britain, changed from a pool in which we had an explicit capacity payment to an energy-only market in 2001. Um, now, what's the problem? Well, the generation investment, which we now need, uh, lasts somewhere between 20 and 60 years. Um, and if you're going to make an investment in generation, you have to decide what type, what fuel you're going to burn, what size, where you're going to locate it. Um, so a large number of important decisions have to be made, but once they're made, you're stuck with them for between 20 and 60 years. Uh, so uh, how much money you make, uh, which is going to determine whether you invest, will depend upon the future price of the fuel you've chosen, so you have to decide which one it is, um, what the carbon dioxide price will be if you've chosen a fossil fuel, um, and then what you will have to pay to transmit the electricity, and also um, what the electricity price will be, and that will be determined not just by you, but by all of the other investors in the market and by trade over interconnectors. Uh, so that's a fairly challenging task, uh, but there's a proposition that says, uh, if you were in long run competitive equilibrium, and if you had perfect foresight and all the usual assumptions, or you had futures contracts so that you could hedge your decisions, uh, then all the plants um, which are competitively justified would cover their full cost, uh, providing you have this scarcity payment, the capacity payment, explicitly or implicitly included. So you do need the demand side in this model. It's not just the cost side that determines equilibrium. Um, and in particular, you need the price to go high enough to cover your fixed costs. So. What's wrong with that? Well, there are a large number of things wrong with that. Anybody who says the market always gives you the right answer has to explain to me how come we don't have futures markets for more than two years ahead? Um, how come we don't have long-term contracts except for certain kinds of plant? <coughs> and what is going to determine the price of carbon is primarily a political decision, and the political decision is very fraught, and indeed we haven't successfully solved how to get a proper carbon price in the electricity market or any other market. Um, so we are stuck with an unstable policy environment um, and a lack of futures markets. So to expect that this will deliver the right answer is pretty optimistic. And indeed, um, no politician really believes that the markets will deliver, uh, which is one of the reasons they intervene and their intervention is one of the reasons the markets won't deliver. So we're in a catch-22 situation. But let's look at uh, how the energy-only markets and capacity markets have worked in the past. Um, and uh, this is relatively recent data, 12, 2012, uh, where we have an energy-only market. And what is interesting is um, France 
has much peakier prices than most of the other countries, and I've chosen the UK market index price, which is a day ahead price, um, and the EEX price for Germany, and the Netherlands price. And you can see the price duration curve is when the reserve margin gets tight um, for a certain percentage of the year, or a certain percentage of the hours of the year, the prices do rise. But they don't rise very much except in France, where they do rise, and they have risen up to 3,000 euros a megawatt hour. And so prices can certainly reach scarcity levels. Uh, the question is whether they do so enough and enough of the time. Uh, now, this uh, compares the pool price in Britain uh, in 1998, before we abolished the pool, when we had an explicit capacity payment. Um, and you can see that uh, the capacity payment is the orange line at the bottom. So that's the pool purchase price minus the system marginal price. And that, that is the capacity element. So you can see most of the time it's zero. Uh, but for some of the time, it does rise to quite high levels. Uh, nevertheless, <clears throat> uh, if you compare that with the balancing price in the energy-only market in Britain in 2008, which was a year of considerable scarcity compared to relatively recently, uh, you can see that the balancing price was actually signaling greater scarcity uh, than the old capacity payment. So an energy-only market and certainly when you get to short-term balancing actions, which is when the scarcities often show up, uh, can give you those kind of scarcity price signals. Um, however, um, recently, and um, this is the balancing price in 2013-14, um, the prices never went much above 350 pounds or 450 euros, uh, which is far lower than the value of lost load. So quite clearly, um, they were not signaling any kind of significant scarcity. Arguably, uh, the impending scarcity was still in the future. Now, um, what about the policy stability? If you could rely on an adequate, durable, and credible carbon price, then you could make the right decision between gas, coal, nuclear power, wind, whatever. Um, and Given the complete failure of the emissions trading system to give an adequate or credible carbon price, that's the blue line um, in the left part of this diagram, uh, the British Treasury announced in 2011 uh, that the carbon price for the electricity sector would rise up to £30 a tonne by 2020, 